Uh, all right, everybody. Uh, so today we've got something a little different for the Physiology by Physio podcast. I have one of my good friends, colleagues, partners in crime, uh, Chase DeMarco, or Dr. Chase DeMarco, I should say, here with me today. And he is going to teach me how to, I don't know, what are you going to teach me how to do? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Partner in crime, I like it. No, we're going to try to go over some of the things covered in the Medical Anemonist podcast. And a lot of those involve memory training techniques, memory palaces, sort of a how to general guidelines. And this is uh, experimental. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, yeah. So this is kind of like a test run to see how we can teach these skills to someone in real time. Um, so I am the subject. Uh, I've never done any, uh, any like mind palace type of stuff. I did use sketchy, I should say, but, um, but I've never, you know, like created any of my own. So I'm really excited to, uh, to try this out and to see if it'll work, if it'll help. And I mean, if it does, I'm definitely going to be using these techniques. And I've been listening to basically every one of your episodes. And I mean, nice. it's fantastic stuff. Like you bring in these amazing dynamic speakers who just have whether it's off the wall ideas or more traditional ideas that they're just able to put the right spin on and communicate effectively, um, that any learner, not just medical students, but any learner can really take a whole lot away from, um, from your show. So uh, hats off to you, man. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I've been really lucky with some of the interviews we've had so far. Just people that I would have probably had a lot of difficult reaching out to or would have spent a lot of money on their courses or they can come on the show and they can share their expertise, their years of knowledge and, and education. And it's just been a wonderful experience. So I hope I can try to distill some of this into a coherent, organized format and maybe teach you in the audience a little bit of how to get started with these techniques. All right. Well, that's certainly enough of a preamble. Are you ready to get going? Yeah, let's go for it. Okay. All right. So uh, today we just kind of picked a random subject to see if we could find a way to cram this information in my head because I can never remember this. So we are going to go over the classes of cephalosporins and what drugs fall into um, the different Phases, different generations classes. generations yes, yeah yes, that's the word that we use that's the doctor speak um, yeah. how how do you how would you go about getting started with something like this so as i'm looking at this and there's the four main generations we have a common theme with the beginning of the name the ceph part of cephalosporins and you could go about this a few different ways so do we want to put all of these images that we're going to try to create in a similar area in like one room of a memory palace, or could we potentially link them in another way, but start thinking about how to set it up depending on the density of the material, how many different topics there are, and sort of go from there. So for this one, I'm thinking that we could potentially have maybe just four markers. Maybe we can try to make one marker for each class and then just attach a little visual hook sort of to each one of them for each individual drug. So when you say memory palace, markers, hooks, what do you mean by that? A visual marker, if you've ever watched a sketchy medicine or Picmonic or anything like that, you know that they create unique visual images that represent whatever topic it is you're trying to remember. So generally these are something that might rhyme with the word or is associated with the word. It's some creative visual representation for an otherwise kind of arbitrary or hard to remember word. And the visual is just going to be easier to remember. That's how our brains work. And then you don't need to put everything into a memory palace, but if you have a lot of information, it's easier to organize. And a memory palace is just a uh, visual architecture. And most people will use their homes, their friends' homes, past homes they lived in, maybe a school or library or some building they frequent. It could even be restaurants. It could be you know, any, any location that you can close your eyes and visualize quite clearly can be used as a quote-unquote memory palace. So once you have a location, then you can start creating spots in a location. 
you can put things in certain orders throughout your, let's say your bedroom, if we're using that. If we were to take, for example, these four generations of cephalosporins, and for anyone listening right now, just use whatever room you're in or your bedroom, something simple, very, very easy. You can close your eyes right now and you can visualize the room very clearly. Then it's going to be fine for this practice drill. Throughout your room, you probably have a front door, a bed, maybe a dresser, a closet, whatever other locations you have within this room, you can potentially use to set your visual markers. So I would say to the audience, as we're going through this, let's try to pick four spots within whatever room you've just chosen. So using the bedroom location as an example, I'm going to say the light switch, the bed, nightstand, and closet. So each of these are going to be a location for one of the generations of the cephalosporins. So that's one way to just set up initially and just to get started and kind of start organizing how we're going to attack these. We haven't actually gotten to the drugs yet, but this is just setting up the basic organization, kind of visually mapping it out. And actually, you should physically map it out too. You should draw it out, sketch it out, write it in words, whatever you uh, want to use as a reference later, because you might not remember these in a few days from now if you don't practice them regularly. So always keep a record of your mnemonics for reference later on. So I, I think that really helps to clarify our terms and helps to give us some structure that we can work within. So if we're going to uh, go after the, uh, the first four generations of the cephalosporins, and you had mentioned, so I'm, I'm picturing my bedroom right now, and my wife has her princess poster bed thing in the middle of it, and then I've got my nightstand next to it, got my closet on the other side of the room, got the, what did you say, front door? Was that one of them? I think I did, a light switch, light switch. bed, the nightstand, and closet. Okay, cool. So I've, I've got those four locations kind of pictured in my brain. And thankfully, I'm very familiar you know, with my bedroom. So uh, it doesn't take very much mental effort for me to conjure up that image in my mind's eye. How are we going to go forward from here and kind of place the different drugs? I guess, what are, what are we going to do from here? Now we have a lot of options on how to go about using the four locations that we've set up, these four loci within our memory palace. And we do have, like I said, initially this common theme of Ceph. So being that I've never really taught this before and I don't know these drugs like the back of my hand, let's try to go through a couple of possibilities, some good ways, some bad ways, and we'll just wing it and see what happens. You want to find something unique to each one of the drugs, but that you can still use together in a visual. So cephalexin is one of the first generation drugs. Uh, cephedrine is another I have here. And cephalothin. Okay. So cephalexin, one rule is you could try to rhyme a main sound with something else that's more familiar to you. So if we do the cephlexin, or we could break it down a different way, cephlex, can you think of a word, one or two for ceph and lex, that that makes you think of, that pops in your mind when you hear that? I immediately think flex. Like flex. Flexing, flexing muscles. Okay. What about cephredrine? Ah, <laughs> cephredine. So, cephredine. You know, uh, the, the, first, the first word that comes to mind is almost like a like a red dreamscape. The way that it was said, redeem, just immediately made me think dream. And then post hoc, I heard the red part. And so it made me think <laughs> of like a red dreamscape. Okay, interesting. And anyone listening, you'll notice that yours might be very different than the ones that me and Greg are thinking up, but that's perfectly normal. You should make them your own personal one, whatever pops into your mind first is going to be most likely your strongest visual marker later on. It's going to be much more difficult to remember what pops into our minds first because our different experiences, educations are going to alter that. Right. Not everyone's as weird as I am. <laughs> um, and then the third one, what about 
cephalothin. Cephalothin. So cephalothin. Mm, man, this is a tough one. Maybe like clothing. Cephalothin. Clothing. Clothing. Okay. And you'll notice that a play on words or a rhyme are usually the easiest ones to come up with naturally. So if something doesn't just immediately pop in your head when you hear a word, those are two very basic word plays that you can use and, and just try to figure out something that might work. So for yours, we have the clothing, we have flexing, we have red dream, was it? Red dreamscape. Yes. Red dreamscape. Okay. So let's see, if we're just taking those three now, and we still have the Ceph part that we can use, maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't, it's hard to say at this point. And often your first first attempt at a lot of these visuals might not be the one you end up using forever. It can change, it can evolve, and that's perfectly fine. So let's see, what are some ways we could do this? Uh, with well, So to be honest, the... Um when you mentioned the idea of having the heads in diff- different locations, that actually really resonated with me. Like, I immediately imagined like heads that would have just kind of weird idiosyncratic parts to them at different points in the room. So why don't we try going ahead with that one? Okay. Yeah. And we definitely can. And if we have unique enough other parts of the marker that we want to add in, then it could work. So just first glance, if you were to add all three of these topics together, the Seth flexing, the red dreamscape, and mm-hmm. the clothing together, what kind of weird mnemonic first comes to your mind? I imagine like this big muscular dude flexing his muscles uh, for the cephalaxin, and then he's like ripping through his clothes because his muscles are so enormously huge. And Maybe this this head is dreaming that uh, he has these huge, enormous muscles such that they can rip uh, <laughs> rip through his uh, shirt or whatever. So good, yeah, exactly. Or maybe you want the guy flexing to have someone in a headlock, and that's why he's flexing. Oh, and yeah, yeah, then you yeah, still yeah. have the head, so you have the head theme of the cephalosporins with the flexing red dreamscape, and he's ripping through his clothes. So, but yeah, that's one way to do it. So. Is that going to be an extremely memorable type of visual for you? And this is something everyone's going to have to answer for themselves. Does that resonate with you? Is it weird enough? Is it vulgar enough? Is it dynamic enough that it's going to stick with you later on? Naturally, if you create it yourself, if it's personal to you, you're going to remember better than using someone else's. Sure. So, all right, we have this image for our first spot, which in order was the light switch. So maybe even to associate it with that location, maybe we want this guy flexing with someone in a headlock. Maybe he's ramming the guy's head into the lights, something that's kind of... Okay, okay. Which is a, I can see that. Yeah. Now we move over to our second station, our second loci, and work on the second generations. So for this one, just take these two. So Foxitin, and cephuroxime. What is something that comes to mind if you try to break up by syllable or just pick the, uh, uh, the strong sounds in cephuroxime? I feel like cephuroxime, I want to think about a fox, but then the next one is cefoxetin. Mm-hmm. So maybe this could be at my fox station. <laughs> and this is also an important part because you don't want to later on accidentally mix them up. When we're starting off and we really don't want to mix up these similar sounding words, we probably want to designate one with the fox and one with something else, especially if we're keeping the head theme too. We have too many similar sounds, similar playing themes, and it could get messy. Okay. Okay. Although, as you were talking there, my brain went to the fox, a tin fox is holding (laughs) a tin, and the cephuroxime is urinating into the tin um, (laughs) and like cephuroxime. So urine for uroxime. And I suppose if you wanted to, you could keep them both foxes or you can have the ceph fox with his tin and maybe something to, uh, to keep the head mnemonic. Maybe he has a bunch of those shrunken heads like on a necklace around his chest. It's kind of like voodoo and maybe a little taboo, 
it, it strikes a, a note to me anyway as something a little sure, odd sure. and makes that visual pop a little bit more. And then whatever's urinating in the tin. So, all right, this is a weird one that's just going to be personal for me, but cephiroxime, for some reason, the last part of it, the in just reminds me of mime. So I have a, a mime that's urinating into the tin. Nice. You can add more than just visuals too. That's something that uh, we haven't really discussed. But before we go on to the next two stations, maybe I should delve into some of the options a little bit more now that we have kind of a, a basic framework, at least to get some initial ideas to work with. You can add all of your senses. So far, we're only really using visual and you can add touch. For instance, the fox picture petting our pet, uh, you know, a dog or a cat. So we kind of could imagine what a fox feels like. Or smell. We have the mime or a fox, depending on which graphic you're using, peeing into the tin. Well, maybe you want to add the smell of urine to that. I know it sounds kind of gross, but it's going to stand out much stronger in your memory if you do that. So make them gross, make them vulgar. You don't have to share these with anyone. It doesn't say anything bad about you. It's just they're much more memorable in general. So might as well use all that you can. So we were kind of wrapping up second generation. And which location was this in? Second generation is the bed too. So yes, important to link the visual markers, the the visual aids that we're creating to the low size. So do you want them laying on the bed, jumping on the bed? They could be, you know, wrestling. There's a bunch of actions that you can add to it. So it's not just a static image. That's one problem with trying to create these materials. You can only usually create static images, but in your mind, you always want them to be dynamic. You want them to be animations moving around, having some sort of action attributed to them. And that'll greatly increase your memorization of it as well. So maybe we have the fox holding the tin. He has the, the chain necklace of, of shrunken heads across his chest. And there's a mime jumping up and down on the bed or another fox peeing all over the place but yeah (laughs) pretty much so yeah you give them the actions that way just like uh the first one with the guy ramming the other guy's head into the light that's much more memorable than him just standing there so that's a good extra point that i didn't bring up is trying to make them dynamic animated graphics from there let's see i guess we yeah we can go on to the third generation, which was the nightstand. I put the nightstand as third because that's how I picture going through my memory palace. So a brief note, some people agree with this, some don't. One rule that some people say is to always go in one direction in your memory palace. So for me, I'm currently going, I'm thinking about going clockwise within my room to hit all these stations. Yours might be different. And that just prevents you from like crisscrossing, which is not too bad in one room. But if you have dozens of memory palaces and you're using all the rooms, if you start going in different orders, it's going to be easier to mix up the materials and put visual markers from one spot into a different room. It may not affect you, but it may. So the third place we're going to go to the third station is going to be the nightstand. And on top of the nightstand, we're going to add these third generation cephalosporins and there's a bunch of these. So uh, we probably don't want to tackle all of these. It takes infinitely more time to explain <laughs> the visuals than it would be to kind of create your own. So we could be here for a half hour. <laughs> we cover all of them. But let's take ceftriaxone. That's a pretty, pretty important one, pretty common one. And maybe cefixime and maybe cefotaxim. So Let's start with ceftriaxone. What do you think of? Ceftriaxone, the triple axis. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's just impossible not to, not to go to that one. Yeah, that's the first one I usually think of too. And I wonder if I didn't see the sketchy video about that first, if I would have reached another visual. But it's pretty easy to, to get that association between the word and that graphic, that mnemonic, that visual marker. And it's easy to implement that one too. So I think sticking with that's probably not a bad idea. And then actually, so kind of the the scene that came together in my mind 
as you listed those three antibiotics was this guy or one of the one of the heads is trying to fix a taxi so uh cefixime and cefotaxime cefotaxime right mm -hmm. he's trying to fix a taxi with a triple x that was like immediately what what came to mind for me I think that's a pretty good one. And having all three of these, uh, these antibiotics used in pretty much one coherent visual is much better than trying to make different ones for each antibiotic. I mean, you could consider the taxi and the individual sort of different objects, but not really. They're kind of, it's all one coherent scene. So I like that. That's a good, I think a very strong, easy scene to remember it's pretty easy to picture someone trying to fix a vehicle. You can picture a mechanic or maybe yourself or a family member in the past trying to fix a car. So the, the hood is open. Uh, some people might use an actual taxi. Some might use like a cartoonish image. Mine tend to be more cartoonish. It gives me more leeway in what I can do with them. So maybe we want to make this like an extreme taxi that uh, it's a taxi bus or something weird. Also, something that came to mind was um, because we're doing the third generation, it could be like Jeff and son and son or something to have like all three generations like who own the taxi company. That can be something to add too. Yeah, you can add different themes like that. That could work. And then if we wanted to take it just one step further, Maybe I'm kind of thinking of the movie Eight Heads in a Duffel Bag since we're on this heads theme. So either the actors from the movie, if you've ever seen it, or the actual heads from the duffel bag are kind of thrown about. Like the guy got in a car crash with the taxi and you can see the heads inside the windows. So we're kind of remembering again that this is cephalosporins. Obviously, everyone has different uh, skills with their creativity when they first start out with these. So some are going to be easier. Some you won't realize that they're not strong visuals until later on, but just get the foundations done and just practice with them and you'll work out what happens. You can do what I did for a long time and study the theory and dedicate relatively small amounts of time to practice and you're not going to get anywhere very fast. Just practice and once you start hitting roadblocks, then you can go to certain forums or contact us and and we can help you work through that roadblock. Yeah, yeah, and I can imagine that trying to implement these there's there's a pretty big, you know, initial like activation energy in a way, you know, like a beginning of the learning curve is very steep kind of thing. So, it's just the kind of thing that takes persistence and then you'll you'll start to reap the rewards and get it done faster. <laughs> Um, the more you practice. Yeah, it takes, it's a, a pretty hefty cognitive load. So it's going to take a lot of mental energies and you might ask multiple times, like, why am I doing this? This is taking way too much time. It's taking too much energy. I feel drained afterwards. But this is the same way that memory champions have expressed in all of their materials, how they felt when they started. And once they come up with, let's say, one visual marker for each deck, uh, each card in a deck, the first time they go through all 52 cards, that's really, really mentally taxing. But after they do it a few times, after they get used to those associations, they become second nature. And after they habituate those associations, then they can remember everything in 30 seconds. So you're creating your own visual dictionary as you go along. And you'll find that as you add to it, new words are going to be harder at first. But as you practice, the old ones get much easier and you keep adding and adding and adding until uh, you can pretty much at some point i'm sure someone will be able to do this just make up visual markers as their teacher is going on with the lecture and they never need to use written notes um all right so we will go on to our fourth loci which is the closet and apparently we only have the one fourth generation cephalosporin to worry about here uh cefepime, which we're having a little trouble coming up with a good uh, play on words there, but I tried to look up on entomology.com. There is sometimes a skill where you can look up words and look up suffixes, look up prefixes, and get ideas for what the word meant in the past and utilize that image. But for this one, obviously dealing with antibiotics, we don't really have that ability. They're 
pharmacologically created names, they don't really have a history or anything to back it on. So uh, we can probably go back to just like using the basic rhyming scheme for the last couple of letters, which is P-I-M-E. So cefepime, but you could pronounce it pime. And if you mispronounce it that way, then you could have lime, dime, something like that, where you might have trouble explaining that to someone else. But if you're traveling around your uh, memory palace and you come up to some kind of interesting image with a lime, you're probably going to be able to pick at least from a list, such as on an exam, which one that's going to be associated with. So like for this, we could have the fourth head in the closet and it's wearing like a lime green hat with a lime on it. Or maybe just to make it a little bit more absurd, have it hanging upside down from, from like tied to a hanger. So it's kind of hanging mid height or your head height. And then maybe it's a little more gruesome or it doesn't even have to be gruesome, but there's a relationship that everyone's probably seen in movies and such where a dead body will have coins put over the eyes. So maybe we want to use two dimes or two limes if you want to use that and place it over the eyes of this head that's hanging upside down. And it's really just hanging upside down because it's absurd and easier to probably remember than hanging upright. So yeah, those are both some examples you could use for it. You kind of go through a couple of these in your head if you don't have one already picked out and say, which one's good, which one's not. The more creativity you have and the more you practice these, the more options you'll give yourself. And then you can kind of pick one that works better for you. Cool. All right. So my guess is that the next natural step would be to then go back through them and make sure that we're not missing anything, right? Correct. Actually, you can do that first, or you might want to skip straight to writing it down and then having that record. So in case you come up to a, a station on your first review and you can't think of it, you've been writing these down during each station. So after each mnemonic that you place somewhere, write it down immediately. But then yes, correct. Once you're done with all of the topic, take a breath, close your eyes, don't look at any notes or any primer, then you're cheating and see how many you can go through. So now everyone listening, if you're able to, don't do this if you're driving, close your eyes and picture going to your first station. For us, it was the light switch. And what visual do you remember for the light switch? And what actions were being taken by those visuals? What made them dynamic in that visual marker? So. Did you remember the guy flexing his arm? Okay, you got one of the drugs. Did you remember that he has someone in a headlock? That might not be necessary, but it kind of associates it back with the cephalosporin drug class. Do you remember that he's ripping through his shirt? So we have the clothing. We have a cephalothin. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it, but for the clothing part, it kind of goes with it. And then what was the last one? Because that was the hardest one. So I'm going to see if you remember it now since you made it. Oh, shoot. The word, the, the drug is cephridine. Oh, in, oh right, right, the red <coughs> dreamscape. Yes, yes. Got it. Yeah. So if you were looking at the notes of the drugs, you'd be able to get it. But I wanted to kind of pimp you on that one just to show that sometimes these abstractions, well, they're almost always going to be the most difficult ones. So they're the ones we're either going to have to practice the most, most likely, or contemplate switching them out with something more memorable. First draft, that's perfect. And you know, we have them, we have them bashing the guy's head into the light switch so we know it's at the first station. We're not going to get him confused with jumping on the bed because bashing his head into the bed? No, it doesn't really work. For the second generation, what was the mnemonic we had for that one? All right. So for the second generation, my mnemonic was I had two foxes and one fox was cefuroxine, so he was urinating. And the other fox was cefoxetin, and he was holding the tin that the other fox was urinating in. And they were on the bed, so I will let you make whatever conclusions. <laughs> <laughs> yep, and I had uh, I switched out the other fox with the, the furious mind, just because I didn't want to use two foxes in that. That was just a personal preference, but whatever is easier for each individual. 
And it's good that you were able to name the drugs that went along with it too. So I might be able to recall the visual mnemonic I made, but then I might not be able to recall which drugs I associated with them. Now, maybe on your first rehearsal of this, you can go back and check your notes. But afterwards, you want to make sure to be able to name the topic that's being associated with each visual mnemonic too. And you're not just remembering the visuals now arbitrarily and not associating them back with the initial topic. Right. So then we go to our third one, which luckily we just picked three of the antibiotics in this class, but there are quite a few more. So you can always add to this if you want to audience. Um, But what did we have for this one? All right. So for this one, we talked about the guy trying to fix a taxi with the triple X. And for me, they were at a taxi company that was kept in the family. And there were three generations of owners. So it was Jeff, son, and son. Jeff, son, and grandson, but whatever. To remind us that these are the third generation cephalosporin, and so all three generations. So I think that uh, we're also discovering that this can be a lot of fun to have like a mnemonics partner to kind of work through these with, or maybe two or three others, because then you can share ideas and you can build off of each other's ideas and make them stronger initially. So it's less work on you individually, just like any other group project. And you can come up with uh, uh, more creative variations possibly. Very good. And then now time for us to move on to the closet. Ah, the closet. So the closet was kind of a pain at first, but luckily we got to think through it for a second there. And so the closet, so the one I, find to be more memorable for myself was the upside down head. So we've still got the head theme rolling, pun intended, Um, (laughs) and then have the dimes in his eyes. So we have that dime rhyming with pime, kind of, even though it's cephapim, but cephapime. All right. So now we've written them all down. We've reviewed it once and and yeah, it's time to probably rest your brain because this probably whole process would take maybe... 30 to 90 seconds if you were really proficient at these, but obviously explaining them all and thinking them out here can take a long time. But <laughs> So one, um, one thing that I think we might want to do for the listeners is to just briefly, briefly cover the super highlights for some of these drugs so that, it, you know, this isn't just like a word association episode, but that they can actually get something medical out of it as well. Um, would, you, uh, would you be willing to help us do that? Sure, we can try. Let's see if my brain's still working. From first-generation cephalosporins, uh, Keflex or cephalexin is a drug that you hear about all the time. One thing to know about the generations of the cephalosporins, so like the earlier generations, so like first-generation, second-generation, those cover gram-positive bugs better than they cover gram-negative bugs. Keflex is commonly used to treat skin infections, skin and soft tissue infections, more of like the minor ones, like like minor cellulitis kind of thing. It's not going to cover MRSA. And yeah, that's that's probably what I would know about cephalexin. Um, sometimes I think you can use it to treat uh, urinary tract infections in some cases too. So uh, second generation, we had uh, cefoxetin and cefuroxine. Honestly, when I think of cefuroxime, nothing comes to mind. Yeah, I'd say about the same. The same goes for me uh, as far as uh, cefoxetin and cefuroxime. So we will uh, Mm -hmm. jump on to the third generation cephalosporins. So third generation cephalosporins. You probably always hear ceftriaxone. It's like, it's everywhere. Ceftriaxone, right? So immediately when I think of ceftriaxone, I think of treating community acquired pneumonia, strep pneumo pneumonia. I also think of uh, treating potential meningitis, like bacterial meningitis. So whether that's from uh, strep pneumo, uh, Neisseria meningitidis, uh, you can also treat with ceftriaxone. Another thing that I think about when I hear ceftriaxone, I also think of treating gonococcus All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm just going to cut in here for one second. So one thing that we didn't mention about the cephalosporins yet, 
They work pretty similar to uh, beta-lactam antibiotics like the penicillins, but they tend to be more resistant to uh, bacterial beta-lactamases. So that's one thing. Also, you should know that cephalosporins are bactericidal antibiotics that disrupt cell wall synthesis by binding to penicillin binding proteins. And also, uh, Chase and I kind of forgot to go past the highlights for the third generation here. So as a quick comment, uh, for the fourth generation cephalosporins, cefepime is probably the one you want to know about. And when I think of cefepime, I immediately think big gun for gram-negative coverage, especially for pseudomonas coverage. So cefepime, pseudomonas. And we didn't discuss this at all in the episode, but there's also a fifth-generation cephalosporin that you should know about, uh, which is called ceftaroline. And what's weird about this one is that it kind of bucks the trend that we mentioned earlier, where the first and second generation cephalosporins cover more gram-positive bugs, and then third generation starts to cover more gram-negative bugs too, uh, like Neisseria, in addition to gram-positive bugs, like Strep pneumo. And then the fourth generation shifts mostly to covering uh, gram-negative bugs, um, like Pseudomonas. So the trend is to move from gram-positive to gram-negative coverage as we move through the generations of cephalosporins. But then when we hit the fifth generation ceftaroline, it mostly covers gram-positive bugs. In particular, it provides coverage against MRSA. So it kind of bucks the trend of moving from gram-positive to gram-negative coverage. Anyways, I hope that that additional info is helpful. Now let's get back to the show. Okay, so I would caution a few things here is when we are initially setting up the memory palace, we're kind of going for a goal a certain way. So we had the goal of memorizing these by generation, which you may or may not want to set it up that way and probably only useful to memorize them that way, maybe for step one. But especially as you're going more into the step two material, you're more likely to need to know what diseases are associated with them, correct? So we're getting more away from microbiology, more towards infectious disease, in which case we have two options. We could take some of the diseases and attach them to the the current visual markers that we've had. And if there's not too many to attach, that's fine. But you probably don't want to attach 10 more details to each of them. Alternatively, we could start another room that has to do with a particular uh, antibiotic or a particular disease or something like that and go through the process a different way. We could do both and then have multiple ways to potentially make these associations. Um, It really depends on how much effort you want to put into it, how much time you want to put into these techniques. You can almost move these symbols onto other rooms as well and into other rooms, right? Um, so like if you already have a pretty strong link to the three axes of ceftriaxone or fox with the tin for cefoxetin kind of thing, then I could use them in another room or another mind palace, right? Correct. When you're making this visual dictionary for yourself, you're making these associations, you obviously can reuse them in other locations and you see that used in, you know, sketchy and pigmonic and such. So it's really up to whoever that uh, is making it. And I would say it's going to be mixed. And I know people are probably sick of hearing this and they're going to be sick of hearing it in the book that we're coming out with as well, but it's really going to depend on the person. I compare the memory training kind of actually very similar to learning a language. So if we would have learned before med school, it probably would have been a lot easier. If we would have learned when we were younger, just like learning a language when you're younger, you know, all the neurons still growing, we probably would be much better at these skills and then they would be more natural and then you can implement them easier for any topic you want and they would just be the way to learn. As we're learning them later on, especially this late in some of our educational pathways, it becomes more difficult and you have to take a lot of time to learn the skills. You have to practice a lot and you have to decide how quickly you're getting the information and what material is going to be worth it to use this for. Because some material you're just going to want to brute force it and some this might be your brute force and some you might want to use a completely different technique. Very cool. Well, I, I gotta say, this has been, this has been a ton of fun. One thing that you just mentioned, actually, uh, you mentioned a book. So can you tell us about that? Oh, sure. I'd love to. So 
as Greg is well aware, since he's helping edit it, we've been working on this study skills book for medical students for some time now, and it is going to be a uh, a collaboration of knowledge, insights, experiences from everyone at Inside the Boards. So we have all of our members from Patrick Beeman, myself, Greg, Ted O'Connell. It's going to consolidate all of our knowledge for teaching. We've hosted some of the greatest interviews with medical educators and non-medical educators. And uh, specifically on the medical anemonists, we've hosted a lot of interviews with memory champions and memory educators. My other degree is uh, in educational psychology. So using some of that learning how to learn knowledge and study is going to make this a very unique book. It's not like anything else out there. I've read uh, a good chunk of the medical education books out there. And uh, let's just say, I think this is going to be much more comprehensive. We're going to cover everything from setting up your study environment, uh, tips and tricks for using your home environment to the best you can, to the most efficient possible, to using your time, your class study time, and the resources your school allows do test taking techniques and an actual step by step process that you can follow that's going to be really easy to follow and really self assess where your weak parts are. I find that to be a huge gap is that there's just not a lot on self assessment and where are my weak points? What do I need to focus on? Where do I have that illusion of competence? I think I know it, but I really don't know it that well. And then last section is going to be all accelerated learning, speed reading, memory techniques, and yeah, it's a really interesting and it's been a really fun work so far. I am so excited about uh, what I've seen thus far. I think it's going to be a great resource for future medical students. You know, you've put in a ton of work reading all of these books and digesting all of this information and learning from the best of the best um, as far as education goes. And from what I've seen thus far, you've essentially put all of the golden nuggets from different resources all into one place and specifically tailored to the medical student learner. Thank you. Yeah, I really hope there's you know no fluff. It's all really useful information. It's all the information I really wish I had before medical school, but I'm glad you're enjoying it. And I really hope that uh, the audience enjoys it as well. Very cool. Well, everybody... Chase DeMarco, extraordinaire. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Thank you.